I'm claiming fair use to cover the images and clips contained in this video. They're here to give background and illustrative information regarding the topic. I acknowledge that all material belongs to the copyright holders. This video covers a series of horror-based comics with some very graphic illustrations and contents that some people may find offensive. If that's you, then please consider yourself warned as I do show and discuss some of the more gory illustrations. OK, that's that done. Let's press on. No horror movie has made more of an impact on me than Toby Hooper's 1974 classic, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Through clips featured on a horror documentary that I caught back in the early 90s, I became obsessed with the film. It genuinely horrified me, but played on my mind for hours afterwards. I vowed that I would watch the whole film, which was made particularly tricky when I discovered that it was banned in the UK at the time. However, I'm going to leave it at that, because I'll be making a specific Texas Chainsaw Massacre video at some point in the future. Today's episode looks at a three-issue comic book series that sees two horror icons go face-to-face, -face, or mask-to-mask. -mask. Buckle up for the clash of machete on chainsaw blade as I look at 1995's Jason vs. Leatherface. <laughs> Jason vs. Leatherface was a mini-series produced by Topps Comics, an offshoot of Topps Chewing Gum, who also produced the Garbage Pail Kids sticker series. It took the main antagonists from The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Friday the 13th and put them both together. Now, in case you're utterly unfamiliar with the properties, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is about a family of cannibals living in a Texas farmhouse, to begin with. The iconic villain is Leatherface, a giant of a man who wears masks made from his victim's skin, based on real-life killer Ed Gein. He also uses a chainsaw, as the title suggests. Friday the 13th saw Jason Voorhees, a disfigured teenager who drowned in a summer camp while the counsellors were off having sex, return to wreak bloody vengeance on anyone foolish enough to cross his path. And Jason's primary weapon is a machete. Us horror fans love crossovers, but they're difficult to do on screen due to various rights issues. Freddy vs Jason was originally conceived of in 1987, but complications with the story and the fact that Freddy and Jason were owned by two different studios slowed it down. The film wouldn't appear until 2003, a full 10 years after the final teaser shot of Jason Goes to Hell. However, Comic books don't have that same problem, and we've been treated to Jason vs Freddy vs Ash, Alien vs Predator, which happened before the film was made, and Army of Darkness vs Bubba Hotep. Topps decided that they wanted to combine the worlds of The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Friday the 13th together, and pit the two iconic villains against each other. I was obsessed with The Texas Chainsaw Massacre at the time. The series was still banned in the UK and held an air of mystery about it. I hoovered up any information that I could find about the films in review and genre books, so this was something I just had to pick up. At this point I must confess that I'm actually not a big fan of the Friday the 13th films. I do enjoy the comedic aspect of part 6, Jason Lives, but generally find it far too formulaic. Come to think about it, I only really like the original and immediate sequel of the Texas Chainsaw Massacres too. Although part 3 does have its moments. So, travelling back to October 1995, I'd adjusted from my transition from school kid to media studies student, and was enjoying the freedom to explore the cult and collectible shops of Liverpool with my new friends. Whilst browsing in a comic shop in the now defunct shopping arcade, The Palace, in Liverpool, I found issue one of Jason vs Leatherface. Wow, new Texas Chainsaw merch, and it's actually available in this country. So I bought the magazine and then went back in the subsequent months to pick up issues two and three to complete the set. 
So far as I know, the series has never been reprinted or released as a graphic novel. So it seems that unless you picked it up at the time, you've missed out. The story was written by Nancy A. Collins, based on a plot by herself and David Imhoff. Artwork, lettering and colours were by Jeff Butler, Brad K. Joyce, Steve Montano and Renee Wittestatter. And the cover artwork was by Simon Bisley. The artwork within the pages of the comic is vastly different to the cover art. For want of a better word, and I genuinely don't mean this disparagingly, it feels quite cartoonish. It's bright, very colourful and wonderfully eye-catching. There's some fantastic panels and attention to detail with the two main characters. It's a bit of an odd beast in that it doesn't really fit into either series continuity, so should probably be treated as an alternative timeline for anyone desperate enough to square it that way. It takes liberties though with both Jason and Leatherface's families. The characters of Cook and Hitchhiker bear little resemblance to the marvellous actors who portrayed them on screen. However, I can almost glimpse Jim Seedow in certain panels and I can definitely hear him in the dialogue. Jason dreams about his family, including his father who would regularly beat him and his obese mother, Doris. Now, as I said, I'm not a huge Friday the 13th fan, but even I know that Jason's mother was called Pamela, and I've no idea whether his father was ever mentioned in the film series. So, there's things like that for purists to grumble at, but honestly, this series is so much fun that these things are so easy to overlook. Issue 1, featuring Jason and Leatherface duking it out, reminds me of an epic 90s video game, I love the fact that Jason's hockey mask looks more organic and like a face. The red eye is a neat touch too. The cover for issue 2 is disgustingly brilliant as well. I really love the paintwork used to create the image. The only downside for me is the extended family. I've no idea who half the people at the table are supposed to be, and they don't even feature in the story. The final issue is a rather grand painting of Jason Triumphant, Bedecked by chains and hooks, surrounded by the corpses of his victims. Again, I like that the mask has been altered slightly to give the impression of a grinning face. However, as a Texas Chainsaw fan, Leatherface is nowhere to be seen. Each issue ends with an essay, which are really interesting reads. The essay at the end of issue 1, written by novelist C. Dean Anderson, is called Halloween Chainsaw Hockey and examines three horror characters linked by masks, Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees, and Leatherface. The essay at the end of issue two is called Keep Telling Yourself It's Only a Movie, an examination of how horror movies reflect our subconscious fears of life, sex, and death. It packs a lot into its three pages, and runs from the horror movies of the 1940s right the way up to the 90s. And this was written by author, editor and scriptwriter Rick Myers. Finally, author of Jason vs Leatherface, Nancy A. Collins, pens the final essay entitled Portrait of the Artist with Hockey Mask and Chainsaw. Here, she echoes my sentiments that the first two entries of Chainsaw are good, but Friday the 13th is way too formulaic. However, she agreed to take the job by exploring the angle of family and their influence on the two main characters. Again, an interesting read and certainly proof that the artists and contributors weren't just aiming for a quick hack and slash gore fest. Nancy is the author of the Sonia Blue vampire novels, but has previously written for Swamp Thing, Vampirella and Predator. In an interview, she mentioned that she was more interested in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre aspect of the story, which she elaborates on in her essay. She does a great job with Jason's internal confusion. As a character on screen, Jason isn't chock full of personality, but Nancy fleshes him out by giving him thoughts on his unfamiliar surroundings and relationships. His view of the world is to kill anything that gets in his way, but begins to question things and changes his behaviour while spending time with the twisted Sawyer family. She did well getting inside Jason's head while still keeping him as the unstoppable killing machine that he is. And I have to say, everybody involved in this did an absolutely fantastic job. It's such a pleasure to read. So, with that, let's dive into the comic section of the three issues. 
The advisory tag at the top of each comic reads, Suggested for Demented Readers, and it ain't wrong. So, last warning, if you thought the cover for issue 2 was gross and you're squeamish or easily offended, skip to the end of the video now, otherwise the consequences are on you. Okay, here we go. We begin at Crystal Lake, long since abandoned after Jason's reign of terror. It has now been used as a toxic chemical dump by an unscrupulous company. However, Jason is still lurking beneath the waters. Whilst the lake is being dredged, Jason is caught up amongst the sludge and the sewage. As the waste is being transported on a train, Jason breaks free and murders a freight train hobo and his little dog too. He then goes off to murder the remaining train drivers and staff, causing the train to explode, leaving him the lone survivor to walk away. As it happens, Jason wanders into a Texan backwoods, where he stumbles across another victim. The man pleads for help, but before Jason can finish him off, he is interrupted by the hitchhiker and Leatherface, who have been giving pursuit. Leatherface switches attention to Jason and attacks him, but Jason defends himself and disarms Leatherface. The original victim is dispatched and, uncharacteristically, Jason returns the chainsaw to Leatherface, sensing a kindred spirit. Jason is invited to the Sawyer house and follows Leatherface and the hitchhiker, where they're greeted by the cook. Hitchhiker mocks Leatherface for being bested by Jason, causing him to storm off. Whilst Cook and Hitchhiker argue it out, Jason checks on Leatherface, understanding the same familial difficulties that he experienced growing up. The family invite Jason to stay, causing him to recall a past memory about learning to write. With this, he scrawls his name on the wall by way of introduction. Jason is reliving the moment of his drowning when he is awakened by another argument between the cook and the hitchhiker. Whilst cook is gone, hitchhiker takes out his frustrations on Leatherface, causing Jason to flash back to his own experiences of being beaten by his father. Cook then takes Jason on a tour of their meat business and shares his dreams of high-class restaurants with him. Hitchhiker then takes Jason out to the backyard to meet his dog, who's definitely seen better days. Cook tells Hitchhiker to get to the gas station for more supplies. Whilst there, he tampers with a car belonging to an arguing couple on a road trip. Racing home to tell the cook he's ready to collect the supplies, Leatherface is dismayed when Cook suggests that Jason accompanies the Hitchhiker instead. While stranded on the road, Hitchhiker comes across the arguing couple. He kills the man with a hammer, leaving Jason to kill the woman. However, he is reprimanded by Hitchhiker for choking and killing her too quickly. After leaving the corpses with the cook, Hitchhiker takes Jason to see his artwork. Everything is going fine until Leatherface accidentally breaks a chair that the Hitchhiker was working on. As the hitchhiker beats Leatherface, Jason again flashes back to the beatings he received and how his mother protected him. He intervenes to rescue Leatherface, causing him to taunt Jason. Jason is about to dispatch the hitchhiker when Leatherface stops him. Jason leaves, causing hitchhiker to berate Leatherface again. Jason wanders the Sawyer house, trying to make sense of things. He meets up with the cook who apologises on behalf of Hitchhiker. The issue ends with Jason heading down to dinner, leaving behind him a family picture of the Sawyer clan. Whilst preparing for dinner, Hitchhiker again takes the opportunity to attack Leatherface 
this time for reading his comic books. After slicing at Leatherface's arm with his knife, Jason grabs the hitchhiker and throws him across the room. In retaliation, the hitchhiker stabs Jason with his knife, but this has no effect on him. Jason has had enough of this and begins pursuing the hitchhiker, causing Cook to tell Leatherface to grab his saw. Whilst defending Hitchhiker, Cook also incurs Jason's wrath, making him a target too. The steel shutter they hide behind proves no match for Jason, and as he closes in to kill, Leatherface arrives to protect his family. Jason and Leatherface fight. As Jason's attention is on Leatherface, Hitchhiker attacks him from behind and brains him with a hammer. This temporarily stops Jason. The family debate what to do with the body. They agree that he's too far gone to be made into food, so they take a breeze block, tie it around him and dump him into the water. A short while later, Jason awakes and considers returning to the house to kill them all. However, he decides against this as things have already got too complex. And the issue ends with Jason taking the lonely road back to Crystal Lake. So there you have it, a decent little series that doesn't outstay its welcome, and gives a bit more personality to its two main antagonists. There's some nice moments of humour in there which certainly made me chuckle. And I did like the conclusion. Ultimately, there could never be an absolute winner, as Jason and Leatherface are two unstoppable forces. It could only conclude with an impasse and a return to the status quo. It's worth tracking down, but issues are really pricey these days, what with it being so old and never reprinted. It's a shame about that, it could do with a really nice graphic novel collection. However, I believe Topps Comics folded in 1998, so with tangled rights issues and things like that, I highly doubt that this will ever reappear. If you're desperate to own the comics, then they appear on eBay regularly, but expect to pay high prices for them. So, if you've enjoyed the video, please hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and leave me a comment below. Let me know what you thought of the comic, if you had it, and who you were rooting for. It helps me know that you're enjoying the videos that I'm making, and assists with the YouTube algorithm. If you've enjoyed this, then why not check out the previous episodes of Amazing World of Stuff, Previously, I've covered the Garbage Pail Kids sticker series, Revenge of Oh the Horrorable, parody cards with illustrations of 70s and 80s horror and cult movies, Terror, Issue 1, a very rare UK horror magazine from the early 90s, Brian De Palma's off-the-wall comedy horror musical, The Phantom of the Paradise, terrifyingly controversial BBC Halloween hoax show, Ghost Watch, a show so notorious they banned it for 10 years. Cult rock band Electric Sixers kickstart a Christmas album entitled A Very Electric Sixmas. And this is probably the only place that you'll ever hear clips of this album, as it's increasingly difficult to find. Scarred for Life, Volume 1, The 70s. An amazingly in-depth book that examines the darker side of pop culture from the decade. And that's not all! We examine rare and very controversial Generation 1 Transformers toy Megatron, the shape-changing gun robot that wouldn't even make it past the planning stage in this day and age. Incredible crowd-funded documentary, The Rise of the Synths, an absolutely amazing overview of synthwave music, along with the artists from around the world who've pioneered this genre. An Acme Inc. biography comic of one of my favourite bands, Oingo Boingo. A potted black and white history of the band, from their early days as a theatrical cabaret troupe, to the careers of band members after they split up in 1995. In Search of Darkness, Parts 1 and 2. A pair of four-hour documentaries, taking a loving and nostalgic look back at 80s horror films, along with the cultural impact and the legacy they left us. And finally, ex-Oingo Boingo lead singer Danny Elfman's latest solo album, Big Mess. An album built up against the pandemic and political backdrop of America from 2021. It certainly wasn't a dull album, but was it worth it? 
Whew. And if that's not enough, I've got some 15 second animated horror shorts on the channel. Give a few of those a go. You might like them. Thank you very much for joining me. I genuinely do appreciate it. Stay safe, gang, and all the best.